Okay, everyone, um, welcome. We're so glad you took the time to attend today's panel discussion titled Helping Students Navigate Challenges During the COVID-19 Pandemic. My name is Anastasia Ordonez, and I'm the Director of Communications, Marketing and Web at the College of Natural Sciences. I will be your disembodied voice guiding us through the conversation today um, and moderating today's conversation. So again, thank you all for joining us. We're really happy to have you here. A few housekeeping notes before I introduce our panelists. Uh, mics have been muted today to ensure that there are no distractions. There will be a question and answer session at the end of the presentation. If you have a question, uh, please type it into your chat window, not the Q&A window that is down at the bottom of your screen. And we will try to answer those questions in order at the end of the session. If there are any questions that we can't answer right away, there will be a follow-up email that will be sent to all participants with those answers. And several materials and resources will be shared during today's panel. So if you don't get a chance to write them down, don't panic. We will follow up in our email with links to resources and more information. And now let me introduce our panelists. We have today Brandy Hapner LeBanc, who is Vice Chancellor for Student Affairs and Campus Life. Vice Chancellor Hepner LeBanc's office is responsible for transitioning and connecting students to campus, cultivating a culture of diversity and inclusion, providing focused support for students in crisis, supporting wellness, health, and safety, and preparing students for successful transition after graduation, among other things. Vice Chancellor Hepner LeBanc has more than two decades of experience in higher education and before UMass Amherst served as Vice Chancellor for Student Affairs at the University of Mississippi. We also have Elizabeth Connor, who is Associate Dean for Undergraduate Education and Development at UMass Amherst. Uh, Associate Dean Connor is also an Associate Professor of Biology with extensive experience in the classroom and the use of effective teaching strategies, as well as development and implementation of curriculum redesign and initiatives to support student success and student research. Dean Connor has received two College Outstanding Teaching Awards and the University of Massachusetts Distinguished Teaching Award. Dr. Connor also serves as Program Director for the UMass Howard Hughes Medical Institute Inclusive Excellence Award. Linda Ziegenbein is an Academic and Diversity Advisor at UMass Amherst, a position she has held since 2015. She works closely with students who are on academic probation, help students navigate on and off campus academic internship and career opportunities, and mentors undergraduate peer student advisors. Dr. Ziegenbein is also a professor of anthropology and has been with the university since 2004. And finally, Rachel Adams is assistant director for academic access with disability services. Ms. Adams' office is charged with ensuring full access for all persons at UMass Amherst, as well as promoting the empowerment of people with disabilities and their full integration into campus life and the community. Disability Services also provides information and referral on issues of accessibility, coordinates guest accommodations, and provides training and staff development to the university community. So welcome to all of our panelists. Before we begin though with our first panelists, we'd like to share a, fe a video featuring some of our College of Natural Sciences students that we released a couple of weeks ago. Let's watch now and then I will turn it over to Vice Chancellor Hepner LeBanc for her to say a few words. Hello, my name is Darshana Blaze and I'm a junior at UMass Amherst. Hi, my name is Maya and I'm a junior at UMass Amherst studying microbiology. My name is Mason Iriana and I am a senior at UMass Amherst. Over the past few weeks, our worlds have been turned completely upside down. Classes are now online, dining halls are closed, and the residence halls are emptied out. Most of us have moved home with our families. 
And while all of this is very difficult, and we are concerned about our next steps, we do know that our families and communities are here to support us. But some students are not that fortunate. As on-campus activities have shut down by order of the governor due to COVID-19, some students are having a really tough time. Some have no food, and many have lost their student jobs as offices and labs have shut down. For these students who are already struggling, they now have no way to pay for rent, food, utilities, and other necessities. Our UMass students are attending college so that they can be tomorrow's scientists, researchers, healthcare professionals, teachers, and innovators. These students are resilient and strong, but they need our help now so that they don't fall through the cracks and have to give up on their dreams. Please consider contributing to the Student Care and Emergency Response Fund, which is supporting students right now who may need financial assistance. These funds help students stay on track with housing, rent, food, caring for a disabled or sick parent, basic health care, or other important needs. If you would like to make a difference in a UMass student's life, please contribute whatever you can at minutefund.umass.edu slash studentcare. And please encourage those you know to do the same. Every donation makes a difference. And together we are UMass Strong. So I'm going to turn it over now to Vice Chancellor Hefner LeBanc. Um, we have received many questions over the past couple of weeks about what the university is doing to plan for the fall semester. And the Vice Chancellor will first give a few updates about fall planning so far, and then share what the university is doing to help students in need. Thank you. And, um... Good afternoon to everyone. Thank you for spending some time with us and, and hearing more about what we're doing on campus and, and certainly how we're supporting our students. So, of course, I think the question that is on everyone's mind is that of, you know, what, what will happen in the fall? And I, you know, I'm gonna just kind of say it straight up, we don't know. <laughs> that's, the, that's the short answer. Um, and I know that that is not um, reassuring. Um, it's not even reassuring for me, but what I can do is share a little bit about the work that's happening and how we're going to get there with that decision. Um, of course, you know, we have decisions to make kind of more locally um, on campus, but first and foremost, we're really monitoring and, and staying up with the federal guidance, like the CDC is, is certainly one that we're listening to and following their guidance. Our state has been, I think, very engaged and very active in monitoring um, the virus within our communities and giving us good guidance on that front. Yesterday, our state issued um, the reopening plans for the state um, and that had a lot of relevance and started to signal some things to us on the campus. So, you know, and we also have the system level and so trying to have a lot of conversations and, and make sure that our system is coordinated as well. But what I can say is based on um, the state's guidance. So they have kind of broken down it and broken down things into four phases. Um, phase one being kind of the start with limited industries resuming operations, then a cautious stage where they'll add some additional industries. Um, restrictions will still be in place. Phase three will be the vigilance phase. Um, again, kind of additional industries um, resuming operations and guidance continuing, and then kind of phase four is where we all want to be, which is that. That kind of new normal where, where hopefully we have a vaccine or treatments um, that are readily available. So from an institutional perspective, phase one, which started today, um, kind of signals to our research core that we can begin to start to um, repopulate our research laboratories um, and get back to that work. And then phase two and three will be where we'll start to look more at how to bring employees back, how to begin to um, slowly activate operational things on campus. Um, and so that's probably the phases that we're really studying the most. And so what I can say with complete confidence is that as I work with the chancellor and the other vice chancellors on campus, our aim is to get folks back to campus, but we want to do that and feel a responsibility to do that in the safest way possible. And so um, to that end, what we have done and the chancellor has charged um, different working groups on campus to 
really provide him with what our campus would look like if everyone was back, if everyone was remote, or if there was some sort of um, scalable hybrid in between. So if we brought a portion of our students back and employees back, um, but yet had some that maybe chose to stay off because of different reasons, or um, maybe we asked some folks to stay off until we could more safely bring everyone back to campus. The committees that are doing that work right now, um, and we'll report in by the end of this month, are our teaching and learning group, and they are focused on the academic course delivery, um, as well as in-person instruction essentials, developing training for our faculty. Um, our faculty are fully committed to, um, you know, work and, and um, really make sure if we do do remote courses that those are high quality. That is something that the chancellor has impressed upon us all along is we had to make a quick pivot in the spring and so we did what we had to do if we do have remote classes in the fall the goal would be to be much more high quality and the same with the out of class experiences as well our second working group are research and libraries um, they um, are charged with developing the plan to reopen on campus activities in those spaces um, they're also looking at our umass center in springfield and mount ida um, and they're really looking at all the physical spaces the laboratory studios performance spaces our administration and finance team will focus on analyzing and resolving the different budgetary implications of the different scenarios that are brought forward. Our student engagement and residential life team is the team I'm, I'm most engaged with kind of directly. We're looking at what will student engagement look like, what will residential life look like in these different scenarios and how will we scale appropriately, how will we engage our students effectively. Um, we're really focusing on you know, things like student safety, well-being, the culture, um, ident cultural identity for our students, the behavior of our students, um, and the holistic development of our students. There's a healthy fall working group that's really looking at the science of all of this and the public health information and guiding us with that mindset. Um, they will really be the ones that will look at the testing, the tracing, um, and, and the management of cases that, that may be in our community um, if we get to that point. And then last is workforce, and that will look at kind of how to staff ourselves and how to keep, again, our staff um, safe as well, but how do we meet the needs of all of the kind of previous groups? So, so that's, you know, we are in the midst of really, I mean, multiple meetings a week for all of these groups where they're putting together recommendations, and these are our experts across campus. And I also think, especially from my role, it's important to mention, we have students um, and our shared governments, bo government bodies fully engaged. We have students on every committee um, because we know that it, it, you know, this is, this impacts all of us on campus and we wanna make sure that we're moving through this, thinking about how we can inform ourselves from all perspectives. So again, not the answer that I'm sure some of you were looking for today. It's not the answer I'm looking for right now because we all want some certainty in our lives right now, but at least gives you a sense of the work that's being done and, and the methodical um, approach that we're taking to make sure we do the right thing. Thank you, Vice Chancellor uh, Hefner LeBlanc. Now I'm going to move us back to our slides and uh, we can resume the panel discussion. So just give me one second. Let me share screen again. Okay. Would you like me to go ahead and keep going? Yes, please go ahead. Yes. Thank you. So I was absolutely, um, I was asked to also bring um, an update on, on kind of one of the topics that was, you know, important to this, this presentation, and that is our fundraising efforts. Um, so we have certainly seen an increase in student needs. I'm going to talk about that in a moment, but we've also seen um, an increase in giving. We've seen folks, um, alums particularly, really come out and support our students in their time of need. And, and to begin with, we are just so thankful for that. So as of yesterday morning, the update was that we had raised um, $107,500 through um, the, the portal that was mentioned earlier. And that was since the start of our remote instruction. So the end of March, um, we've been able to raise that kind of money to put toward the student needs that, that I'll talk about here in just a moment. That includes 768 donors, um, and the um, 
University of Massachusetts Alumni Association Executive Committee also made a $10,000 donation and I think deserves some special recognition for their early commitment to getting this fundraising effort kicked off. So, um, so we, the SCURF fund, um, we all kind of laugh the, the name, but this, this emergency fund was stood up probably about five years ago to assist students in need. Um, and, and those needs are for lots of different reasons, but, but we all know that, you know, students don't always come to us with the support of a loving family or support, a financial support that many other students have. And so we just are always finding that, you know, in order to help students be successful, we have to help them also personally um, find those resources and find that support in a different way. And so this was stood up um to really assist students in need and uh, certainly when we started to see the impact of COVID-19 we knew that this was going to be an invaluable fund and a service to students that they would seek out so we knew that we needed to do something quick to increase awareness about it and make sure that folks knew the the option to to give to this so this fund has been awarded um, since March 2020 to 83 students um, and in addition to just that 83 we also kind of extended and did a hardship process so we did an if you could actually go back to the slide the one slide for one second we did a, a an option where students who um because they had to go home or for other reasons because of some employment decisions on campus lost student employment we extended this hardship process to those students as well so we saw 257 students apply through that process so in comparison to this time last year, where we had 35 students served in the spring, since March 29th or 2020, we've served 399 students through this fund and the extension of this fund with that employment, loss of student employment hardship process. So on the next slide, um, it kind of gives you a sense of dollars. Um, last time, or this time last year in spring, we dispersed about $8,000. Um, $418, but again, since March, just March, so not even the full spring, we have, um, we're nearly at 190,000. This is um, on the next slide, kind of, it really is kind of an astronomical increase from years past. And we always talk about, you know, this being unprecedented times, but truly over a 2000% increase from this time last year in these requests. So, why do students come to us? We are seeing lots of different reasons, but the next slide highlights the top reasons that students are reporting. Um, the financial aid, of course, that students are extended covers tuition expenses, but students are often left with the responsibility for covering the cost of other personal essentials, such as food and housing expenses, the childcare, healthcare needs, those sorts of things. And so something as small as just an unexpected medical bill or a car repair can really upset the financial security of a student and put them at risk. So COVID-19 has kind of taken folks out at the knees, essentially. Um, a student, um, we've received individual requests that range from $80 to 5,500. Um, we typically give 5,000 to 1,000 to each student. Um, and we do look at their, their financial need and make sure that we're doing what we can to meet the need. But in addition to that, we are also giving them card swipes on campus. We're doing other things beyond just the disbursement from this particular fund. But um, a really a small amount, a small donation can make a huge difference in helping a student to remain enrolled and frankly, to release that anxiety of having to worry about that particular bill that's outstanding or, or that pressure that's in their life. So um, I think you could move to the next slide. Um, to me, I just wanted to highlight um, that the, the need will continue. So right now, um, checked with the Dean of Students Office yesterday and they were in the process of processing 59 more applications. Um, so we're anticipating that we're probably gonna need throughout the summer, probably another 200,000 or more. Um, and we'll just continue to raise the funds and, and figure out how to get there and continue to support our students. Certainly, I wanted to highlight the ways you can help. And there are two, first one is give. So give money to this fund. Um, again, it will go directly to the students most in need. And I, and I assure you of that. Secondly, um, we are going to be standing up what we're calling Project Reach Out. Um, and what we know is that even more so than financial insecurity, students are struggling with mental health. St students are struggling just with the shift 
um, with the isolation that's come with this. And again, not all students are, are returning necessarily to a loving home. And so we will be standing up over the summer, particularly thinking about the fall as to how to um, connect folks with students um, that are in, you know, just need of having kind of an accountability friend or just someone to connect with. We're going to ask um, alums, faculty, staff, stu other students just to simply reach out, email, you know, to start with. But then what we do is ask you to just touch base once a week and just be, you know, a support to one another. We all need this right now. And so we think that this is going to be an important effort as we move forward. So I guess kind of envision big brothers, big sisters, but kind of in our in our environment now. So those are two key ways that we think that you can engage. Um, and I hope that you will. And I think I'll pause there. Thank you so much, uh, Vice Chancellor Hapner LeBanc. Um, and as, again, a reminder to folks, especially those who might have joined after we began, that we will be sharing all of these links in a separate email that will come to you after this session ends. So, and, and there will also be, uh, this is being recorded. So we will be sharing uh, that recording as well um, at a future date. Um, so now I'm going to um, turn it over to uh, Associate Dean Connor, and she is going to share sort of the experience of students right now, um, some of the uncertainty that they're feeling and uh, as well as some of the, the career planning that is taking place to support them. Hi, I wanna thank you for your interest in our students in UMass. So evidence suggests that the move to remote learning in the COVID-19 crisis has really either exacerbated or even created challenges that our students are now facing. And we have, I'm gonna share some evidence with you, but we also wanna learn from that in anticipation of our return in the fall and try to figure out how we can help alleviate some of this stress and problems. So if we all, we're talking here together on this Zoom today and had a whiteboard, I think we'd come up with a list of issues that we think students have faced since March when we went to remote learning and will continue to, to um, face in the fall when we come back in whatever mode that is. So I think we'd say financial issues that Brandy has touched on. We found internet and computer access problems from their homes the loss of face-to-face -face learning experiences like labs, so important in our college, research opportunities where students are working on campus, at the farm, in the field, doing independent research, Exp other experiential learning like group projects, capstone experiences, and internships. Also, being at home, even those who are returning to a loving home may be returning to a crowded home with young children, home from school, to working parents. The complexity of the home life, as we all know, has changed significantly. And big on our list is loss of community, that connection that our students have with one another staff and their instructors. And for me, I also miss UMass Dining and I bet a lot of them do too. And we won't, I'm gonna to focus today on the first three issues and give you a little information, finances, computer access, and the loss of face-to-face -face learning experiences and how you can help. So on April 9th of this year, we were three weeks into remote learning and our Office of Academic Planning and Assessment create, um, did a remote learning check-in survey to gather feedback from our students about their experiences with this abrupt transition to remote instruction. And from this, we can actually learn as we plan and prepare for fall. Now, the data I'm gonna show you is for our CNS students. And they're similar to the university data. Our student response rate was 39%, which is quite good, our statistics people will tell us for an online survey. So let's turn to finances. Many students, as we know and are experiencing among our family, friends, are seeing a problem with income. 
parents are being laid off, they've even lost their own jobs. And 47% of our college students, uh, our college and natural science students work while they're full-time students. So that's 47%, many of whom left their jobs on campus. 33% of those worked on campus and another 14% worked off campus. Many in the town of Amherst, for example, a number of our pre-med students, nursing students work locally as um, certified nurse, nurse assistants, CNAs in local nursing homes and they lost those jobs and training opportunities. Another 12% have work study in our college. So your financial support is really helpful in helping us make up this deficit. The other issue I raised was about internet and computer access at home. Some data for you. CNS students of them, of the st students who responded to the survey, 30% rated the quality of their internet connectivity at home as fair or poor. Most have computers to access, but 8% of those computers had either, um, they didn't have a microphone or a webcam. I have a cat here who's interested in participating in Zoom, so let me set him aside. Now, we don't have any measure of are they sharing computers with their siblings, with their parents. So that's something we weren't able to determine. We do know from anecdotal data that students had broken devices, that their, their machines, some were working off of phones. And the other issue that was raised that many families did not have big enough plans to provide the gigabytes per month that they need. So here too, we've seen UMass come up big in helping students have access, address these problems, and you can help us continue it as we, if we need to do this come, come in the coming fall. The final thing I wanted to mention was the loss of face-to-face -face experiences. You know that the residential experience that the College of Natural Science offers to our students is well grounded in the hands-on hand, hands experiences in the lab, in the courses that students are taking, and the opportunities that they have. So we see that students are missing the lab experiences, independent research opportunities, and internships. We're trying to create good solutions and replacement solutions. And as we look to the future, we're doing everything we can to make positive impact in decisions for the fall. How can you help? I'm gonna re, you know, you're gonna hear this. I'm gonna follow uh, Brandy and say, your financial support is critical to our students returning in the fall. Some really are going to be addressing whether they can come back. But I also want to mention that you may have the ability to offer virtual internships or research opportunities or work with a faculty member and provide data sets for analysis in a virtual world. And so we'd really appreciate you reaching out to us if you have that opportunity. Thank you. And now I'll turn it over to Anastasia. Thank you, Dr. Connor. And so I'm going to um, share the screen again. And we're going to uh, now hear from uh, Dr. Ziegenbein, who's going to talk about um, some of the issues with food insecurity that uh, some of our students are experiencing. Great. Welcome and thank you again, everybody, for taking the time out of your day to, to attend this session. Um, I want to talk a bit about food insecurity. I've been asked to speak about food insecurity and hunger at the University of Massachusetts. This is an issue that hits particularly close to home for me. Um, I was I helped to create the student um, the uh, the student food pantry that is on our campus. And, um, and this came about actually as a student, this is a student-led initiative. So I think one of the things that is wonderful for those of us uh, who work closely with our students is, you know, 
the students have the fierce urgency of now. And in the class that I taught for the peer advisors, we talked about the issue of food insecurity on college campuses across the nation. And one of my students, um, and one of my students had, oh, I'm sorry, I'm being, um, and one of my students, when, uh, when this was brought up, said, you know, that she was a part of a fraternity that, uh, that is a, that is a service-based one. And they took it and she brought this idea to her fraternity and they established the first food pantry, which I think is, um, which I, I think just really speaks to how transformative this, the college experience is for students, but how our college students really are transformative to the college, uh, to the University of Massachusetts. So one of the things I want to talk about initially is what is food insecurity? So food insecurity and hunger is really, it's about not just not having access to food, but it's ha not having access to a well-balanced meal, right? So the sort of stereotypical um, undergraduate meal of top ramen, right? Of, of sort of noodles, something that is not particularly healthy, but is filling. That a student who is supporting that this is, if this is a, the, a primary way that a student is feeding themselves, this is, um, the student is facing food insecurity. And so there was, in 2018, there was a study of all institutions of higher education in the state of Massachusetts. And they estimated that about 33% of our college students in this state experience food insecurity. So they are not sure at any given time where their next, um, where their next well-balanced and, and nutritional meal, nutritious meal is gonna come from. Now the University of Massachusetts did not participate, but it's been estimated that between 25 and 30% of the students at our institution um, are experienced food insecurity. And in real numbers, what we're talking about then is we're looking at between five and 6,000 students at any given time are, um, are not able to have access to a nutritious meal. Now, so the, um, and so what this means though is, again, students can't afford balanced meals. Not all of our students live on campus. So students who live off campus have to economize on things like uh, their groceries. They have to worry about um, whether or not they're going to have enough to eat. And even our students who live on campus, uh, what I see is students will buy the most, the least expensive meal plan because they are trying to support themselves um, and they're trying to choose the most economical way of getting through the university. And so they choose the, the, the cheapest meal plan and the cheapest meal plan does not allow them to eat every meal. And so I have students who come in and say, Linda, I have, um, I, my, my budget is I can do two meals a day, five days a week. And so then they try to figure out how to allocate those two meals and which two days they can choose to not eat. And why we should care aside from simply the fact that we want um, that everyone has a basic right to, uh, to have enough to eat is because we know that hungry students cannot study, right? And what the research shows is that the, the, the literature talks a lot about students needing grit, they need um, needing tenacity, just sort of good old stick to itness. But what we also know is the research is pretty definitive. Uh, willpower and that grit is a finite resource. And so any of us who have tried to do multiple things at one time know that we cannot do all of those things well. And when one of the things that students have to worry about is what they're going to eat and where they're going to eat, um, that takes away from the energy that they could be devoting to their classes. And so what I like to say is that one of my jobs and one of the jobs of all of us here at the University of Massachusetts is to make sure that our students have student-sized problems. And those student-sized problems are things like, have I studied for my exams? Um, can I do all the work? Uh, you know, does my roommate like me? Things like that. Am I making the most of my time? Things that are not student-sized problems are, will I have enough to eat? Am I, com am I safe on this campus? Am I welcome on this campus? Those are institutional problems. And as people who have come to the University of Massachusetts, you all know about how important um, and how transformative the experience of being in a college campus is. And so one of the things that contributing to the Student Care and Emergency Relief Fund 
allows you to do is to say that we are a community and as a community, we belong to each other and that we will take care of one another. Um, so there are some resources available on campus, right, for students who are experiencing food insecurity. There is a food pantry that I mentioned before. Um, it, is not, it does not operate over the summer. So that is something that is not available to our students. And that's available to undergraduate and graduate students. And then the other is the new, no student goes hungry policy uh, operated by the University of Massachusetts Dining. Um, and that is one where if a student is experiencing food insecurity, they can get um, a limited number of swipes to allow them to eat on campus. Now, this doesn't address though food insecurity for students who are not living in Amherst um, and our students who are, who are living not in the area in, in other states and other countries are international students who may be living in the area, but certainly they don't have enough, they can't get enough swipes to be able to eat on campus for the entire summer. Um, and so one of the things that a contribution to the Student Care and Emergency and Relief Fund allows is for those students to apply for funding to purchase things like groceries, right? Things that they, just to allow them to meet their basic needs through the summer um, and recognizing that you know, our students our, are, are part of our community. And so as a community, we can come together and we can take care of one another. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Sigenbein. Um, so the next uh, person, the next panelist um, is Rachel Adams, who uh, is going to describe for us a little bit more about the work of our disability services, uh, as well as the well-being, emotional well-being and health of our students. Uh, thank you, Anastasia. And thank you all um, again for listening in on such an important cause. Um, and you know, the things that we're talking about here today, we see happening across higher education and students' experiences across the country where they need support more now than ever because their access to acquiring these resources have shifted. Um, and it, higher education plays such an important role in people's lives, right? If you think about the UMass community, this is not just a community where students go to to learn, but it also serves as their place of residence, where they get jobs, a place where they can find friends and it, resources that they may not have otherwise had before attending UMass. And I think it's really important, um, kind of like what Linda was saying, to send this message that even though students don't have physical access to our community, that we're still a supportive community and that we're banding together to support these students through the hardships that they're facing. Um, and so in this slide, you see there's some data here that was published last week in the Chronicle of Higher Education where they conducted a survey about the mental health impact COVID-19 has had on students. Um, and you can see that nearly half of the respondents reported that they were affected financially. Um, over half reported that they need to locate, which also can be a huge financial burden. And the majority of them said that they were feeling lonely, sad, stressed, and anxious. Um, and these mental health concerns compound with financial concerns and they can adversely impact students overall well being. Um, you know, thinking about vulnerable populations of students and their access to resources when they're on campus. Um, and I can speak about students with disabilities in this regard, um, access to mental health counselors or support groups, academic support groups, um, jobs in order to financially afford self care practices. Um, they've students are finding themselves in a really different scenario right now, um, and they need support in accessing these things remotely. So, you know, for a lot of students, the priorities have shifted, and this is kind of what Linda was also discussing. Um, many students are operating in survival mode right now, and they are feeling disconnected from their community, just like Elizabeth spoke to. Um, can you go to the next slide, please? 
And so looking at, um, you know, my colleagues and all these departments that's stepping up to show that we're still here for the students is immensely important because we are representing UMass and we're also representing that we care about the students and want to support their basic needs. Um, so on this slide, you see that I have Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Um, and at the bottom of the pyramid, we can see basic human needs. So these are the things like access to food, access to water, shelter, moving up financial security, employment, access to resources. And COVID is really interrupting the student's ability to access these things. And the stress that this causes them impacts their learning outcomes, right? Hungry students can't study. Students who are worried about where they're going to live can't study. Um, they're, they're struggling because the environments that they may be living in are not conducive to their learning. So right now, I know that my colleagues over in CCPH, the Center for Counseling and Psychological Health, are meeting with students remotely, which is awesome. Um, I know Disability Services is also working really, really hard to help accommodate students who are struggling with this situation, but sometimes the accommodations aren't enough. Um, and I've seen a big shift from focusing on academics to focusing on problem solving for basic needs. You know, where am I going to find funding to afford medication? Um, am I going to be able to acquire medical equipment? Um, or if I need to find a new therapist because I can't see one in the state of Massachusetts, now I'm living somewhere else, can I afford these things? Um, so, you know, without these basic need resources, students are less likely to focus, stay motivated, and retain information. And many students who are needs insecure do not end up persisting to graduation, which can impact their employability and further compound their financial burden. Um, and it can have long-term detrimental effects for students. And this is why it's so important that they have opportunities to access these resources over the summer to help them through this tough time. Can you go to the next slide, please? So, you know, what can you do to help? Um, right now, I think donating to this fund, you're giving students opportunities for hope um, that they'll persist through college and find a new way of navigating through life's challenges like this pandemic. Um, and I think it's really important that students have access so they're able to become the innovative researchers and the hopeful minds that we need so desperately right now. The bright young scientists, the frontline medical workers, um, your support will give these students peace of mind in knowing that their basic needs will be taken care of. So they're going to have that brain space to focus on their academics. Um, and on this slide, I have some resources um, about the Student Affairs and Campus Life cluster that Disability Services is in. Um, the Wellbeing Access and Prevention cluster. Um, there are many ways that students can opt uh, access resources online like yoga through Campus Rec. Um, therapists remotely, uh, we have learning specialists that help with students to keep them on track and be that kind of accountability system um, like Brandy was talking about in the Project Reach Out. But we also need more help because the students are facing unprecedented challenges. So anything that you can do to offer them hope and opportunity for the future is going to make or break their experience. So I really urge you to donate because this is such a good cause. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Um, and thank you again to all of our panelists for, you know, taking the time to walk us through um, how the university is both, uh, you know, understanding what students are going through um, and as well as faculty and staff. There's also you know, a lot of resources that have been uh, put together to ensure the, you know, the, the well-being um, of our 
of, our, of everyone on campus. Um, we are now going to turn to questions and um, I am going to stop sharing this screen and uh, bring up the video for all of our panelists. And again, a reminder, two reminders that we're gonna share all of the resources that you have uh, seen and heard mention during today's panel discussion uh, in a follow-up email. So if you don't get those links right away or you didn't write them down, that is okay. We will be sharing them again uh, in a follow-up email as well as a recording of this video. And now I'm going to uh, bring everyone up for uh, Q&A. And if you have a question that you would like uh, to share with our panelists, please use the chat window at the bottom of your screen. Uh, you can just type in that um, and we will answer them as they come up. If we do not answer your question uh, or you know, our comments, um, we will be sending around in that e follow-up email some answers to the question, the most common questions that come up. But you know, we do have quite a few participants in here. So again, with our apologies, if you do not hear an answer, immediate answer to a question that you have, uh, we will be following up uh, with all participants on this. So with, with that, um, the first question that I am sharing with panelists is, um, let's see if I can start my video as well so I'm no longer a disembodied voice. Um, so the first question that we have here is, uh, what has the 2019 graduate uh, been doing for the past year if they have relevant job experience that would matter? And I think it's probably a, a question about, um, you know, alumni and how they might um, be helped by resources from the university. If any of our panelists want to want to address that. You'll have to unmute yourselves well, if you want to talk. I will. I will try to. Uh, I saw that question come up and I actually sent a quick email because there are university data on job seeking by our graduates of 2019. And I think that a large percentage of our students, we can get the actual number back to you, but a large percent have found jobs. Others have gone and, and joined programming for further education. We have students who have gone to, especially in CNS, a lot of graduate programs and into pre-health uh, postgraduate training like medical school, dental school, nurse practitioner programs, all those kind of things. Um, so that I'm sorry that I don't have, if I get the, the email response from that, I've written our career office asking for our data. If it comes in, I'll let you know. Thank you, Elizabeth. Does anyone else um, have uh, anything they want to add to that? Okay, we'll move on. Um, there was another question um, uh, related to, you know, sort of how young adults uh, without a college degree, uh, what are their options for earning a living wage and supporting themselves? You know, I think that maybe we can talk about career planning uh, from the university's perspective if anybody wants to take that. Sure, I can, I can address that question. Thank you, Linda. Yeah, so I can say that at the university, um, you know, what we recognize is the time that the students are here at campus is a time of great exploration. And one of those things is what is a career that is a good fit for them? And one of the things I like to say to students who attend new student orientation the summer before they begin their freshman year is when they reflect back on where they were when they were incoming freshmen in high school and they think about where they were when they were seniors graduating, right, just a couple of months before I encountered them over the summer, that they should expect a similar sort of transformation at the University of Massachusetts. And so one of the things that we do is you know, through gen ed classes, through targeted classes, but also through really encouraging students to get real life hands-on experience through internship, 
research experiences, um, lab experiences, uh, jobs, that, that is an ongoing, what I like to think of it is a four year conversation that we have so that a student com who comes in when they're 18 doesn't need to think that they need, to, that they know, that they know for sure exactly what they're going to be doing in their lot for the rest of their lives. And that what we do is we give them the support and the guidance to allow them to do that really important personal work, right? Um, which is to say, what is it that I feel called to do? What is it, where are my passions? Where are my talents and my skills? And then what can I do to really prepare myself well when I'm at the University of Massachusetts to step into a career that will allow me to meet my own personal needs and, then, and to meet the needs of the world in which I live? May I continue to? Yes, please. I want to give you a sense that, so I, I think the question also, in addition to career planning was about what about those students who work during the um, as being full time students. And I want to tell you that even if a student finds themselves remote, we are hiring the student population really helps is the engine behind much of the work we do. The university will be open. A lot of work can be done remotely, for example, in a um, an intro biology lab course, we are hiring peer advisors. So they will be, whether they're face-to-face -face or remote, they have jobs and will be doing those jobs. So there are a lot of opportunities that will exist. The way they exist is gonna be in a way that keeps them safe, but we're just going, we need our students to, to help us deliver the best experience. So, and many students kept working into uh, the end of the semester remotely supporting each other as peer advisors, peer counselors. So that's one example, but Brandy had something to say, I think. You, um, you actually stated what I was gonna say. I, I think the underlying assumption was if college campuses are closed and I can't speak for all college campuses, but I can say with certainty that we will be open. Um, and that is something that Chancellor Subaswamy has also been very clear about. So it's just a degree of um, how will that look between some, you know, whether it's all, re all remote or online or if it's in person. So I just, I did wanna make that clear that, that we are not looking at an option that, that would deem us closed. Thank you. Um, so we have another question uh, that's related to, you know, how alumni, um, some of whom are on this call, um, you know, have lost their income and may be struggling financially with the same issues as students. Uh, what is the university doing to address those, those concerns? I have no idea. I'm going to say this is where SCURF comes into place, right? Because certainly there are students who, are, who have lost their jobs on campus, who go home and their parents have lost their jobs as well. And those students can apply for assistance through SCURF. And so donations to the Student Care Emergency and Relief Fund are not in those ways, are not only helping the students, but it's also helping their families. Yeah, and I would add again, it's not necessarily, I don't know what alumni is doing, so I don't want to speak for them, but from, a pers from the perspective of supporting students, I do think that it's important that families, that their circumstances change, that's when they need to reach out to us and let us know how we can relook at financial aid packaging and those things so that those students um, can get more support. Um, CARES allocations also have gone out to at least undergraduate students and graduate students will soon come. Um, so we are in the process of, of deploying those resources that, that will directly impact and help families. Thank you. And just a reminder, um, if questions are not directly answered on this call, it may just be that, you know, um, our panelists don't have immediate uh, answers to those questions, but we will uh, compile all of the questions that we've received during our panel discussion today and send answers uh, to these questions in a follow-up email. So please look for that information as well. Anastasia, can I just piggyback sure. quickly? I see that um, Nancy Sinclair uh, added that she wanted to see that really what she wants to know are other ways in which people 
who may not be in a position to contribute financially um, can support our students? And I think that is an excellent question, and which is why I wanted to jump in quickly so that we could all address it. There are lots of ways in which people who don't necessarily have the money or you know, who, who don't have the financial wherewithal to support students can support. And, and really at the very, at the very, very, very minimal, right, it is to talk about the ways in which your experience at UMass has been transformative in your life, right? Because when we talk about the students who are the most vulnerable at this moment, one of the questions that they're thinking about is, is this worth it, right? Is this worth it? And to say, no, having been through this, and I say this as someone who was a first generation low income student who worked full time when I was an undergrad, um, that really the message to have someone on the other side say, it is hard, you know, this, it may not look right now like it is worth it, but I promise you it is worth it. Like at the very minimum, that is what you can do to reach out, to get involved in the Alumni Association, um, to, to get involved in the program that Vice Chancellor um, Hefner LeBlanc talked about where you can be connected to students to just say, you know, it is, it's like, I'm here, like I can be a sounding board to you. I can connect you to resources. This is what I do. I am a grown up, right? And if you are over the age of 25, the undergraduates consider you a grown up. So I'm a grown up and I can be there for you to sort of lend it an ear. And the, the importance of a contribution like that really, really cannot be um, overstated. It is like those things are profoundly important. Thank you, Linda. We have another question um, about what is being done to prevent students from dropping out uh, due to COVID-19 effects, let's say uh, due to unemployment of parents or guardians, which is a really important question we've been getting quite a bit of recently. I don't know if anyone who wants to take that one. Yeah, I can mention, um, so begin with, certainly we stood up that um, loss of unemployment hardship process and, and, and definitely served a lot of students through that process. That process was directly connected to our Dean of Students office and that was very purposeful. So we have case managers in that office that will continue to be in touch with those students and new students as, as circumstances change and we know that this is ever evolving. And so we continue to, um, you know, communicate with our students directly on a weekly basis, typically of reminding them of the resources that are available and how to how to reach out and let us know how we can be supportive. And, and we do pretty much take, you know, a case by case um, analysis of that. I mean, we want to work with the student, find out what their needs are and support them where they're at. And that looks very different student to student. So um, that's the best thing uh, and the, you know, for lack of a better way to say it, the easy button is to call the Dean of Students Office or get a student connected to the Dean of Students Office and we'll do what we can to work with them and, and get them the support that they need. We've had good success thus far in, in helping students um, continue in their, I mean, that's, that's the goal. We just want them to be able to continue in their academic career and not have the interruption. And I can contribute something there because we have to find them, right? Some of these students are dropping off our radar. And so each of the colleges is looking to see what student didn't register for classes because registration for the fall happened online while they were away. So that is what we'll be doing is now that the semester is end, Ended. We're going to look to see who hasn't registered for the fall and reach out to them individually and then connect them with Brandy's office, the Dean of Students office, as needed should there be identified barriers that are preventing them from engaging with us in the fall. And I can also say that um, for students who are registered with disability services, we have a very similar system um, where there are case managers who meet with students and communicate on a regular basis. And when we start to see that communication drop off, that raises a little red flag. And then we start to up the communication and check in with them and try and troubleshoot and see, you know, where the barriers are. And if it's beyond the scope of what our office can offer, then we're able to, connect with other institutional offices and get referrals for the students to get those wraparound services that they need. 
Thank you. So uh, I just want to acknowledge we have a, a comment from one of our uh, participants who says that uh, she is glad to help by providing educational support as a mentor. Uh, she is a dentist and graduated from UMass in 91, it looks like. Um, thank you, Olga. <laughs> And I, you know, that raises a question I think that we have seen uh, shared with us even before this panel by people who registered and elsewhere um, about mentorship and you know, how alumni can help by being mentors. And I don't know if any of our panelists wanna address that particular uh, issue or topic. Um, Linda, I know you mentioned before about other resources that alumni you know, have and, uh, at their disposal. Uh, to help out, but if there's, you know, specific, uh, anything specific you want to say about mentoring, that might be a good time to do it now. Well, I'll share a little bit more. So our, the project reach out that I mentioned earlier, and, and we're still um, kind of developing what that will look like, but I will say Rachel mentioned the cluster of um, our wellness access and prevention group on campus and there are the folks that are really kind of looking at that kind of holistic experience of students and how they're doing um, as a whole person um, and uh, you know the work that they do is is phenomenal um, and really what we're also looking at as we move through the summer and into the fall is depending on where we land with the instruction and whether we have students on campus or not we also think you know we're going to have international students that will not join us because they just physically cannot get here we will have students that have health conditions that they just are not going to feel safe to come back to campus. So we're, we're going to still have students that will be disconnected from us in that way. And what we want to do is make sure that they're very connected to the UMass community. So the project reach out is really going to be focused on pairing folks up. And one of the tools that we've used um, and piloted this past year is, is a, a program called Cojourn, which is um, where you pair up with someone and I mean, we call it mentoring, right? But Cojourn is this book that's talking about just how you work with someone else and just really be a support and help someone meet their goals, get to know them, figure out what motivates them and then help them, you know, and at the same time, they're helping you. And so it's this kind of interdependent relationship. And so call it mentoring, call it Cojourn. That's the sort of thing that we're aiming for to really try and establish and build some structure around as we move into the fall because we all need that more than anything right now. We are, you know, even in the student affairs world, we keep talking about social distance doesn't mean we socially, you know, so it's physical distance, right? It's not that we need to socially still be connected and that's really, really important. So that's what we're trying to do is to build that network. So um, again, those are things that we would love to engage. I think alumni could be very powerful as, as Linda um, mentioned before, I mean, your experiences, what you, you know, the relatability piece, and then just seeing you that, that you're successful, you've moved on and, and you're continuing to accomplish things. And, and that can be, you know, lots of, that could be career, that can be family, that can be church, that can be all kinds of things. But knowing that, that there is life beyond college, because we all felt that way at some point, like, oh my gosh, will this ever end, um, is really important. So, um, so please, that's, that's an amazing contribution that you all can, can give, so. Thank you. Um, we have a question here about uh, co-designing solutions with students and parents and uh, wondering if, you know, they have a powerful voice in what the academic year will look like. Um, this raises for me questions about, you know, how, what the role of parents and families are in, in these conversations. So wondering if any of the panelists um, want to respond to that, if there's anything that comes to mind that you'd like to share. I feel like I'm talking a lot, but we have an office of <laughs> services um, in the Division of Student Affairs and Campus Life. And we do have um, parents that are serving different leadership capacities and, and help us guide us in decisions and things like that. You know, where we are in the planning process right now, I don't think we've moved to that place. I mean, I think we're asking a lot of questions and, and we need to get to some recommendations and solutions. So I think once we get there, that will be a group that we would rely on. Um, and certainly we've, there's been different points in time throughout all of this that we've done outreach. So I, I would hold up kind of the, the graduation celebration that was done. There was outreach to students and families to say, what would you like? Um, and I, you know, in my opinion, it was amazing what they came up with um, and they did a great job. So um, that is a community we, we do want to have touch points with and make sure that we're talking with. We can 
always do things better though. And, and with the students, you know, I'm always trying to circle back to them and kind of say, can we plug you in more? How can we do more? So thank you for the, for the reminder and for the feedback. That's great, Brandy, thank you. Anyone else have anything they wanna add? Um, experience either with, you know, uh, engaging with parents and families? Okay, um, so let's move us on. Um, so we've gotten a couple of questions around um, tuition and you know, students paying tuition uh, both for the upcoming year, um, for this, this year that's closing out. Um, I'm wondering if anyone on our panel wants to address how the university is handling uh, questions related to what some feel might be, you know, an interrupted academic year. Well, I'll give it a stab. I'll, I'll say in echoing Brandy, the university is open. We're open right now. We will be open the day after Labor Day, the start of classes. And so we are here and we will continue to deliver an excellent curriculum, whether we are face-to-face -face or whether we are um, doing some things remote. So we're still in flux, but the university is open. Great, thank you, Elizabeth. We have another question um, from someone who uh, says they teach at the postgraduate level at the veterinary school and have seen a large increase in the number of students requiring special accommodation in areas like testing. Are you seeing an increase in numbers within this pandemic and requirements for accommodation? And how are you ensuring that students with testing accommodations are having their needs met while doing remote testing? I think I can take that one. Um, so the, the short answer is yes, um, we have seen an uptick and folks registering and asking for accommodations because, you know, learning in a remote environment is very different than having classes face to face. Um, and so we are working with faculty right now um, to ensure that students are getting uh, testing accommodations put in place. Um, the most common one I can think of is extended time. So, you know, if they're taking something online, then the time span that they have to be taking the test is extended. Um, and some flexibility, uh, I know this semester there was some flexibility where you had like 24 hours and you got to choose which time you could start or finish because people are in different time zones. Um, and I also know that we have had some folks um, work as scribes or readers to help with exams remotely. Um, so we've gotten pretty creative about it, but um, we're always here to consult with faculty and come up with some solutions around that. Absolutely, you don't have to do it on your own and we're here to help. Thank you, Rachel. Um, so we have received a, a question that I'm going to share now uh, prior to this uh, panel today. Um, and this is around um, what advice do we have for students who are graduating from high school right now and hope to start at UMass this fall? Um, I don't know if anyone wants to, to take that question on. Well, I'm gonna tie. So this is what advice we give to a student who is looking to come to UMass to start their undergraduate career in the fall. That's right. Well, the first thing I would say to them is we cannot wait to see you and that we are here and that we cannot wait to get connected with you, to bring you onto this campus and to make a connection and to really start your undergraduate career on a strong note and to be with you during your, um, during your entire time. The other thing I would say is rest up because um, as someone who works with undergraduate students directly, that first semester is, comes as a shock to everybody uh, because students come in to the university with the, um, with the experience of having 
a year long some a, a year long academic year and that the 14 week crunch is challenging and um, and I would also say to be gentle with yourselves right because this is uh, it can be a rough transition um, what I like to say to students is you will meet brand new friends and you'll make great connections and you'll meet fantastic people but a, but part of your first year experience also is going to be you will learn how you can be in a room with 200 other students and feel incredibly lonely and that when you have those hard times that you know that there are resources on this campus and there are people on this campus to help you through it but to be excited that we can't wait to see you and also just to be gentle it's a process thank you linda anyone else want to add anything to that i would add okay i'm going to add yes, go for it <laughs> first of all, the first one would be um you're the student i keep thinking about as we're going into this fall planning i mean we really do want to do what we can to get back to a normal operation but do that safely so you know thank you for motivating us as we as we work this problem i will say that secondly directly to those students so um i well i should say get to know linda because she has amazing energy um <laughs> so that's great advice but what i would say is um, don't be afraid to fail. And I want you to fail because that's where the learning occurs. Um, it truly is in those moments when you fail and, and you can come here and stumble and there's going to be folks that will help pick you back up and help you learn how to do it differently and better and, or, you know, how to just figure out how, you know, you want to get it done because that's what's the most important. This is your journey. And so make sure that when you come here, you're open to that um, and you're open to, um, the help that others will offer you and in, in figuring out who you really are and what you really want to do in life and finding it that passion. So I think, I think we don't talk about failure enough and it's, it's okay. And it's important to the journey. So I'm thankful for the moments um, that I've failed, even though it doesn't feel good in the moment, I've learned that that's really when the, the good, the good learning occurs. So. You know, can I second that? Because as a school of natural, Natural science, a college of natural science, scientists and mathematicians and statisticians, failure is common. In our careers, that is what we take a risk, we do an experiment, we revise the hypothesis, we design a new experiment, the first equation doesn't work. You know, this is what we do. So in experiencing and surviving that failure, you're actually practicing a skill that will serve you in your discipline and your craft. Thank you, Elizabeth. And I also just wanna, if I can uh, emphasize, you know, for, for practical minded folks um, also who are, are listening for details of information about things like social distancing and, you know, and all of that. Um, so the university has uh, taken steps to ensure that, you know, we're, we're meeting the needs of our incoming students and, and that we're maintaining um, recommended social distancing practices. And also um, we're planning on replacing the in-person uh, June and July orientation sessions with a phased orientation model um, that you know combines remote academic advising and course registration uh, as well as uh, expanded online orientation um, and some and programming during the fall welcome so those are also aspects you know for folks who are listening uh, for those kinds of details they are being shared out um, you know, regularly via all of our communication channels through emails, uh, social media, and all of that. And again, we'll put that into our email as well um, when we send out uh, a copy of this recording and, and some of the other resources that have been linked here today. Um, let's see, so we're coming up near the end of our, our session. We only have a few minutes left. Um, so I'm just looking at some of the other questions that have come up. Um, and, yes, Brandy. I want to ask about Lincoln and I did, I do want to address that or Lincoln. Apart. Yes. Yeah. Um, so absolutely. Those students, we, from residential life perspective, we are working with those students individually to figure out what their plans are. And they, 
it varies. Um, some are international students and we're, we're helping them with, with kind of finding a new apartment. Others just need to stay through the summer. Some are in classes, some aren't. But we are working with those students to make sure that they, they have housing throughout the summer. So um, I just didn't want to let that go by without kind of putting people's minds at ease about that. And just um, since you know most of our uh, participants actually can't see a lot of the questions that are coming through, um, so just for, for people's you know uh, own understanding, so the question was actually, will the university allow students to remain in Lincoln apartments while attending summer semester classes? Uh, and Brandy, I don't know if you want to expand on what Lincoln apartments are and what what the the re relevance is. Yeah, there's a lot of, it's not completely, but a lot of graduate students that live in that. And certainly we have a lot of grad students staying over the summer um, in their, with their research and other things. Um, so that's, it's a graduate, it's sensitive because of the graduate student population. So, um, but, but eventually that will, we are, it is time for those buildings to um, be demolished and new to be built. They're, they're not the best living conditions. So we're, we're getting ready to to move into some construction in that site. But that's something we've been working with those students for well over a year, I think, about the timeline. And certainly when this all came up, it complicated that. But we we went through that with the mindset of we need to take care of the students and make sure that they they don't feel pushed out or feel like you know they can stay with us um, through the summer. So Anastasia? Yes. There's also a question about uh, fall registration numbers. Yes. And so I can address that that we're happy to say that our deposit rates are on track with where the admissions office wanted to be. Now, can we predict who will actually come in uh, fall? No, we never can. So, but we are really happy to be where we are right now. And we're optimistic to, in greeting all of those in the college, many, many um, hundreds, of students and new student orientation in less than two weeks. Thank, thank you, Elizabeth. Um, so the last, we, we've gotten a couple of questions about distance learning and, um, you know, sort of virtual learning, um, just trying to synthesize some of the, the questions that we've received. Um, I think that, you know, we also had gotten one question, at least one um, prior to this panel beginning, but Basically, I don't know if anyone wants to address uh, the distance learning programs, both you know, UMass Online, University Without Walls, and also how you expect that um, you know, increased distance learning will impact uh, student learning and you know, any other details related to that. I can just say a couple things, you know, we have learned so much in the last six weeks from the instructors to the networks that people have built sharing best practices in a remote learning environment and also the the um, instructional media and the internet people on campus have risen to the, the challenge. So I think as we approach the future, we are incredibly optimistic about UMass Online, the University Without Walls, and our ability to deliver a good curriculum in the remote world. I want to echo what you had just said. Um, I am on a, a few different committees and you know I have some colleagues within various different departments across campus and um, you know more informally there's been a lot of discussion around how much we have learned um, with the remote uh, learning environments and remote teaching environments. And so I think a lot of the faculty are really excited to be, you know, updating their curriculums to be more conducive and multimodal. Um, so it reaches a wider audience of students. Um, so I, I want to say that I think um, a lot of us are coming up with some pretty innovative ideas and I'm excited for what the fall semester brings in that regard. And I'll add briefly that it also has opened up opportunities to engage with students that maybe we weren't engaging with before because these students are online in a different way or um, and students have taught us ways that we can engage. So. So um, I'm, I've learned about all kinds of social platforms I didn't know about. I've, you know, it's it's been a it's been a real learning journey for me. But um, I what I love about it is I feel like we're reaching 
we have the potential to reach more students. We need to measure that to say that with confidence, but I do think that um, we have that potential and that's exciting to me. So silver lining is there. So. Thank you, Brandy. So I'm gonna give a chance, uh, I don't know uh, if panelists have any kind of closing words that they would like to say um, before we, we move to close the session. I think I can say something, um, you know, it, thinking about ways you can contribute to the UMass community, um, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be financial. Um, it can be, you know, time volunteering um, or networking even, but I think that whatever you're able to give, um, you know, you really are providing students with opportunities and you're also sending the message that you believe in them and i think that students need to hear that right now because some of them are struggling um, and they might not believe in themselves to the full capacity that they were prior to the pandemic so your support goes beyond just financial. It goes into that social connection. It goes into that engagement. Um, and I really think that whatever you're able to contribute is it's gonna be really impactful. So please, you know, it's such a worthy cause and I'm really excited to be on this panel and to chat with all of you today about that. Thank you, Rachel. And I just want to also say a few closing words. I, you know, again, thank you to the panelists for participating in today's conversation. I, you know, um, a lot of what we're hearing from students, but faculty and staff and others around the university is this feeling of wanting to get involved and wanting to help out. And that feeling of community that's emerging from a lot of this, you know, and, and there's been various folks, including Dean Sirio, who have said, you know, we're looking to even the small gestures that people do, the, the emails, you know, the phone calls to check in on people to make sure that they're okay. All of those things are critically important, not just for our students, but for everyone, uh, because we're all in this together. And so we are hoping to facilitate, um, you know, some of that by uh, providing resources, expanding resources um, where we can you know, encouraging those networks that exist naturally at the university, both from alumni and current students. Um, but we also want to make sure that our communities are part of that network and that people are connecting with each other, you know, outside of the university network, because that is also critically important. And um, again, we will be sharing um, these resources with folks in follow up uh, email. We have a series of these uh, panel discussions set up for the summer and hopefully into the early fall on a whole host of different issues. Um, and this is also sort of our effort at the College of Natural Sciences to try to better connect people to things that they're concerned with and that, that are relevant to their research, to their work, uh, to their thinking and their lives right now. So we will be continuing to send out uh, notices about those upcoming panel sessions very, very soon. Um, but again, a big thank you to all of our panelists uh, for taking the time today. This is a long session, but I think it was well worth it. And uh, I'm going to bring up uh, my screen once again, just to share a contact for uh, one of our CNS um, staffers, Julie Taher, who is um, kind of the person that is, uh, you know, helping set up these, these panel discussions, but is also a great entry point. If you do want to make a donation or if there's other ways that you can think of to contribute, um, Julie's a great person to reach out to, to help make that happen. So again, thank you all uh, for your participation and I hope you have a very healthy and well rest of your week. Thank you. <laughs>